Well, good morning. Recently, my, uh, my daughter, Lilia, she's the oldest of three, she's nine, recently she asked me, Dad, what did you want to be when you grew up? And uh, I hadn't thought about that in a while, and um, I was kind of thinking, what, was, what did I want to be when I grew up? And my earliest recollections actually are, uh, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Like, when I was a kid, baseball was king in America. And uh, I wanted to, I loved baseball, so I, really my earliest recollection of what I wanted to be when I grew up was I wanted to be a professional athlete. Uh, imagine, my, um, imagine my dismay when I got a little bit older and realized you have to be athletic in order to be a professional athlete. <laughs> but that is what I kind of wanted to do. Uh, you know, as soon as kids can talk, people will ask them that question, right? As soon as a kid can talk, people ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And even the wording of the question is very telling, because we tend to say, what do you want to be? As a a society, we connect our work with our identity. What we do equals who we are. And really, actually, we connect our work with our worth. What you're able to do, what you do for a living, what sort of work you do determines your value and your position in society. This morning, I want to talk to you about work. Uh, At the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible has some things to say about work, and I think they are uh, both surprising and significant. And this morning, as we look at our text in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to learn three things about work. First, we're going to answer the question of why we work. Secondly, how we get work wrong. And last, how can we get work right? Why we work, how we get work wrong, and how can we get work right? Right. Our text comes from Genesis 2, beginning in verse 1, and the author of Genesis here is sort of tying a bow on the creation account, and we get to the seventh day, and it says in verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Some things are so obvious that we, we miss them. And there's a lot of debate and discussion around Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and that's not the point of this morning's message. But sometimes we get so deep into Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 trying to figure things out as far as timeline and science and, and all that sort of stuff that we miss the major point. And the major point here is that God chooses to reveal himself to his people first in Scripture as a worker. God at work. God is a worker. In fact, in, in verses 2 and 3 of that text I just read to you, the word work is repeated Three times. There's an emphasis on the idea that God is doing work, that God is at work, that God rests from his work. Well, what kind of work does God do here at the beginning of time in Genesis 1 and 2? I made up a list of the type of work that I see God doing here. He's doing creative work, intellectual, verbal. He's speaking things, thinking, thoughtful, constructive, construction. He's building things, communicative Manual labor, he's, he's, he's using his hands when he creates uh, humanity. Organizational, practical. The work that God is doing here is aesthetically pleasing. It's beautiful. Still thousands and thousands or whatever your belief is, millions and millions of years later, whatever you look at, it still takes our breath away. We still think it's beautiful because God created something that is beautiful. Productive, it, his, his work provides substance. It provides a place for flourishing. All of God's work is interconnected in a supportive, life-giving way. We could summarize it by saying this. In Genesis 1 and 2, God is creating for the good of creation. He's at work. Okay, so God's at work, but why do we work? Let's keep reading. Verse 5, it says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man or human to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now let's go to verse 15. It says this, The Lord God took the human, or the man, and put him in the garden of Eden to work it 
and keep it. Why were we created? If you ask, you know, you sort of average churchgoer, lifelong Christian, why were humans created? The most common answer you're going to hear is, we were created to worship, right? You've probably heard that before. We were created to worship. And it's true. We were created to worship. But here's the thing. That's not unique to us. Everything was created to worship God. In Psalm 64, or I'm sorry, in Psalm 66, 4, the psalmist writes this. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. The psalmist doesn't say everyone on earth. The psalmist says everything on earth. And we see this in other psalms, right? The the metaphorical uh, language of the trees of the field clapping their hands and the mountains shouting to God and the oceans roaring his praise. Well, how does creation worship God? They didn't, you know, we just stood and we just sang some songs together. Uh, The trees don't do that. The animals don't do that, unless it's a Disney movie. But we, 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 we don't, we we do that, but they don't. So how do they worship God? Well, all of creation worships God really in two ways, by being what it was created to be and doing what it was created to do. So now, what about humanity? Who were we created to be, and what were we created to do? The answer is actually found in Genesis 1, 26, where God is having a conversation with himself, because he's a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and he says, let us make man, or let us make human, or humanity, in our image. Who have we been created to be? We've been created to be image bearers, those who bear the very image of our creator, worker, God. What have we been created to do? Well, the text says that when God created Adam, created the first human, he did it for a very specific purpose, so that Adam would do what? Tend, keep, and work the garden. So what all this means is that the unique quality and contribution of humanity as the only image bearers in all of creation is that we've been created to work as God works, to work in the same way that he works. Humankind was created to work in creation, work on creation, work with creation, work over creation, and work for the good of creation, and to do it in a way that reflects our creator, God. So when God says to Adam, I want you to work, keep, and tend the garden, he's giving a mandate really to all of humanity because Adam is a representative of all of us. And he's not removed this mandate from us today. The the same mandate that was on Adam is on us to go and to work and tend and keep the garden. Here's another way of saying it. We've been given a mandate to be culture makers, to to, to be those who take the raw ingredients that are found in creation and to make something of them to improve upon them, to to build, to to have ideas, to be creative, just like God was, to be culture makers. For for much of history, the word culture primarily, um, primarily was used just to describe agriculture. And so to be a culture maker in an agrarian society really was to to take the land and to take the seed and you would work the land and you would till the land. I mean, I've never been on a farm a day in my life, so I don't really know what I'm talking about right now, but but I I think that's what they do. Uh, I think they they do something with the ground and they put something in it and then I have uh, um, corn on the cob. Like that's kind of how it, uh, that's about as much as I know. But, But that's what it meant for much of history to be a culture maker is to take the raw ingredients of creation into, but in our society today, culture is, the conversation's much broader, right? We're talking about music and art and technology and science and education. But the mandate still applies to you and me today to be culture makers. And we do it. If any of you in this room are artists uh, or, 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 sorry, or authors, uh, you know that you take the raw ingredients of words, ideas, pen, paper, maybe your laptop, and your gift of imagination. And what do you, what do you make? A story or, or an argument or a book. If you're a carpenter, you take the raw ingredients of wood and metals and tools and the skill of your hand and you might make a table or a door. If you're a chef, you can take the raw ingredients of flour, egg, water, salt, and presto, 15 minutes later, fresh pasta. I'm no chef, but if I take the raw ingredients of my cell phone and my credit card, I can have pizza and wings at my door in 30 minutes, presto. Sorry, (laughs) not as impressive. One of the primary reasons that we've been created is to work. And isn't it interesting to note, I know you just finished a series with Pastor Bob where you were looking at the meta-narrative of Scripture, right? I don't know if that's the word he used or not, but the, the, the big story of Scripture from beginning to end. 
And when you, when you step back and you look at the big story of Scripture, what God is doing, what you realize is that the story begins in a garden, but it ends in a city. It begins in a garden that needs to be tended, needs, needs to be kept, needs to be worked, but it ends in a city that defies any sort of human explanation, uh, defies our ability to put words to it. Now, how do you get from a garden to a city? Work. And lots of it. Lots and lots of work. And so if God is telling this story and we get to be a part of it, we partner in our work. And what this suggests, this idea that the, that the, that the story begins in a garden and ends in a city, this suggests that the world that we inhabit, it's in process. It's under development. And your work, whatever it is, can contribute to getting it from the garden to the city. You partner with God. Um, what this also means for us is that as, as those who bear God's image, working or doing work is not simply an act of obedience. It's necessary for personal fulfillment, but it's also necessary for the flourishing of creation. There's no way there without work. Now, when I talk about work this morning, let me just clarify. I'm not just talking about the work you're paid to do, although that's a big part of it. But it's just sometimes you just do work around the house, right? Housework, yard work. Uh, some of you just do certain work for fun, for recreation. There's things that you do, whether you're, you like to paint on the side or you like to play an instrument. All of that sort of work is lumped into this conversation. It's all ways in which we bear God's image. And this is why we work, because we were created to bear his image, and in bearing the image of a working God, we work. Okay? Second uh, question we want to answer this morning is, how do we get work wrong? And there's two errors that we tend to make when it comes to how we approach work. On one hand, we have people who endure work. And on the other hand, you have people who adore work. Another way of saying it is there are people who work to live, and there are people who live to work. Let's talk first about our tendency to just endure work. You know, the average American spends uh, in their lifetime over 80,000 hours at work. Does that take the wind out of your sails this morning a little bit? 80,000 hours of your life at work. There's a recent survey, or sorry, a recent study done by ABC News, which seems to indicate that America has just passed every other industrialized nation in the world with the amount of work that the average person does. More than any country in Europe, and just recently more than any country in, in Asia. Americans work more. Now, some people debate this study because it's self-reporting. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're reporting for themselves how much they work. But even if they're exaggerating their self-reporting, it's an indicator of how Americans view the importance of work. Uh, some people, I'm not going to ask which one you are in this room, but some people love their job, and some people hate their job. For some people, their job is, like, meaningless. It's mundane. If, if I could do anything else, I, I would. There's a famous comedy uh, that came out years ago about work called Office Space. And in this film, the main character, Peter, is venting to his psychotherapist. And I want you to hear what he says, and some of you will relate to this, but don't raise your hand if you do, especially if your boss is in the room. <laughs> he says, so I was sitting in my cubicle today, and I've realized that ever since I started working, every single day of my life has been worse than the previous one. So that means that every single day you might see me, that's the worst day of my life. It's funny, but sadly, it's true for some people, isn't it? You know that. And it may be somewhat true for you this morning. You, you can't see any connection between your everyday Monday to Friday job and the call on your life to worship God, honor God, and image God. But I want us to, I want us to just look at something really important. The text that we're looking at this morning is Genesis chapter what? Two. The next chapter, this is very easy math, is Genesis chapter three. What happens in Genesis chapter 3? The fall. Adam and Eve rebel against God. Why is it so important that we notice the order? Because work exists before the fall. Work is not a result of the fall. Work is not a result of sin. Now, our work changed because of the fall. God told Adam, it's going to get harder. All that work you were enjoying, it's going to be harder to do now. But work was God's idea before the fall. And by the way, one of the implications for this is that if work existed before the fall, it's going to exist when everything's made new. So in the new heavens and the new earth, wherever that is and whatever that looks like, we're not going to sit around playing harps on clouds. We're going to work. 
you're going to continue to work. In fact, probably the only people out of jobs will be people like me because I won't need to preach anymore because you'll see Jesus for who he is. You'll all have jobs still, and I'll be uh, living off of you, I guess. Um, so remember me. Remember me in the next kingdom. But in the new heaven and in the new earth, you're going to continue to work. But can you imagine the sort of work you're going to be able to do un- uninhibited by sin and brokenness and disease and the limitations of our minds? Can you imagine the songs that are going to be written? Can you imagine the art that's going to be created? Can you imagine the meals that we're going to enjoy? Because work is not a result of the fall. Work existed before the fall. Uh, one of the most helpful books I've read on this topic, which is worth reading if you're interested, is called Work and Our Labor in the Lord by a man named James Hamilton Jr. And he says this, Work is neither punishment nor cursed drudgery, but it's an exalted, godlike activity. So when we endure work, we kind of take on this mentality, ah, work is punishment, work is drudgery. No, work is your opportunity to image a working God to bear his image properly in the world that he created. Well, how do you know if your work matters? How do you know if the exact job that you do is a sort of work that honors God? Scott Sauls, who's a pastor in Nashville and a, and a wonderful author, I read a blog that he wrote on work, and he said this, and, and I agree with what he's saying. He said, any kind of work that leaves people, places, or things in better shape than before Any kind of work that helps the city of man become more like the city of God, where truth, beauty, goodness, order, and justice reign, is work that should be celebrated as good. Any type of work that leaves people, places, and things better than you found them, that improves upon things, that improves the quality of people's life, that encourages people, that provides for people, any sort of work like that, it's good work. It's the sort of work that God does. He goes on to make the point that when we do our work in this sort of way, we are imaging God in a variety of ways. Let me give you some examples he gives. Mothers, mothers image the nurture of God. Artists and entrepreneurs, the creativity of God. Government leaders and business executives image the rule of God. Healthcare professionals and counselors, the healing hand of God. Educators, the wisdom and knowledge of God. Nonprofit workers, the mercy of God. Fashion inventors and stylists, the beauty of God. Marketers and advertisers, the evangelistic energy of God. Authors and storytellers and filmmakers, the drama of God. And the Buffalo Bills, the cruel humor of God. We, we have this opportunity in our work to image God. And one of the things that makes our work good is that it's done in a way that reflects how God did and does his work. Now, earlier I read to you a list of descriptive words to, to try and uh, unpack the type of work God did in Genesis 1 and 2. I want to read that list to you again right now. But this time I want you to think about your work, your job, what you do, whether it's uh, paid work, volunteer work, recreational work, housework, yard work. And I want you to listen to these words, and I think you're going to hear a word or two or more that actually describes the work you do. Creative, intellectual, verbal, thinking, constructive, construction, thoughtful, communicative, manual labor, organizational, practical, aesthetically beautiful, productive, providing substance, providing a place for flourishing, work that is interconnected, in a supportive, life-giving manner. See, good work provides for others, blesses others, meets the needs of others, and makes life possible for others. And good work is good work simply because it's done well and with excellence. Now, sometimes, uh, specifically in the realm of art and music and writing, we've put this sort of pressure on Christians who say that they are artists and authors and and songwriters, and we put this pressure on them that if your art is going to be Christian, if it's going to glorify God, then it needs to say X, Y, and Z. You know, if you're going to paint a picture that glorifies God, Jesus has to be on the cross in there somewhere. Like, I'm painting a picture of the ocean. Just put him in. Just put him in. Otherwise, it's not, it's not Christian art. And I'm, I'm making a little bit of fun, but isn't it true that we've put some utilitarian demands on the artist and the authors and the creative people in the church, and what we've actually done is we've stifled their creativity. Because God's not just glorified by the product, he's glorified by the process. And when we reduce art to some sort of propaganda or tract, even if it's promoting a truth, we're actually short-circuiting 
what it means to be an image bearer of a creative God, who somehow in all of creation, despite the fact that nothing technically says God exists, it all points to him. That's what Romans teaches us. Through his work, he points to who he is. And so we have this uh, mentality sometimes that, well, work is only good if it accomplishes X, Y, and Z, but work is good if it's done well, and it really doesn't matter, and nothing else really matters. If you do your work with excellence, you're imaging God in the way that he created you to be, which means you're being who you were created to be. You're doing what you were created to do, which is, as we defined earlier, worship. You're worshiping him through the excellence of your work. There's an interesting uh, interaction later on in the Old Testament between the prophet Jeremiah and the people of Judah who are in Babylonian captivity. They're exiles, they're refugees, they've been dragged from their home to, this, to Babylon. And uh, they have this mentality of, God's going to get us out of here eventually. In fact, they have promises that God's going to help them return someday. And so they've decided, we're just going to wait for God to come get us. Jeremiah rebukes that mentality. He says, no, 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 no. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, 7, he basically says to them, plant gardens, build homes, have families. And then the summary phrase is this, work for the good of the city. It's still true to us today. Sometimes Christians have this mentality, well, this big bad world is all going to go away someday, so I'm just going to hold on until God takes me out of here. I don't care anything about this world or what happens to it or what happens to the people in it. But I think God is still saying to his people, no, 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 no. Work for the good of the city. You live in Rochester? Work for the good of Rochester. Help the city flourish. Because part of God's mandate, part of his plan in Genesis 1 and 2 is that all of creation would flourish. He, he cares for it all. Uh, there's a famous quote that's often wrongly attributed to Martin Luther, and it, it goes like this. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes he makes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. And I would add, your neighbor needs good shoes. You're leaving things better than you found them. I know the value of good shoes. Two summers ago, I was in Disney World with my three daughters, and we bought tickets to go back-to-back -to -back days, and we rented this, like, huge stroller that all three of them could sit in. We're like, this is brilliant. I'm going to be able to push them around. And then I got to Disney World, and I tried pushing them, and I was like, this is the worst idea we've ever had. And so for, like, 12 to 14 hours, two days in a row, I'm walking all over Disney World in 110 degrees because it was August, paying 12 bucks for a bottle of water. And I'm pushing this thing, and, for, and, I, and, and I was exhausted, and I was tired. And the very next day, after that second day of Disney, we got up in the morning, we got on a plane, we went to Orlando, we got on the plane, JFK or JetBlue to JFK, and when I got on the plane, I was fine, but when I stood up in JFK on the plane to get off the plane, it was like somebody was driving a, a, a nail through the top of my right foot. I've never felt this sort of pain in my foot before. I think it was an inflamed tendon or something had just gotten injured because I had walked around for two days and I didn't walk around with very good shoes. It was one of the more embarrassing moments of my life because I had to get wheeled around the airport in a wheelchair. My poor wife is dragging three kids and all our luggage and some orderly is like pushing me around the airport. I actually for a second was like, this is the life. Like, this is sort of, this is sort of poetic justice. I mean, I pushed these girls around the last two days. Somebody should be pushing me around. But I learned the value of good shoes. We've been back to amusement parks since then, and I wear the best sneakers I have. No matter what they look like, I wear them because I understand the value of good shoes. And one of the ways we do good work is we provide good things for our neighbor. We do things with excellence, and we give them the best that we have. Now, maybe there's no shoemakers in this room, but there's other types of jobs. Let me, let me list some other jobs and tell you uh, how you, I think, can bear God's image. If you're an author or an artist, you know what you do? You have the tremendous privilege of creating worlds. You do. Authors create worlds that people enter into. You capture imaginations. You help us see beauty, but you also help us long for real beauty. And, you, and you, you tell stories. If you're in education, you're shaping the minds and hearts of young people. Last Sunday, I preached my brother's funeral. He was a 31-year-old school teacher in Las Vegas, and he passed away unexpectedly in his sleep. And during the service, two of his ex-students stood up and, and shared about who he, who he was to them. And it was amazing to hear one of them say, I hated writing when I became one of his students. I thought writing was dumb. I never wanted to write. And now I love I love to write because Mr. H. If
If you're in healthcare, you are extending God's healing hand and serving those in pain. If you are in construction or manual labor, you are planning and you're building, uh, just like God did in creation. You are providing shelter. If you're in transportation, if you drive a bus or you drive a taxi or you do an Uber, you help people arrive safely to places like school and work where they can grow and they can contribute. If you're in the military or the government, you're working for the peace of our nation and the order in our society. If you're in law enforcement or if you're in the law, you protect the people and you work for justice and you defend people when no one else will defend them. If you are in management, then you have organizational oversight and you're helping people to work together and thrive in their jobs and discover what they're good at. If you're in waste removal and janitorial work, then you are definitely leaving things better than you found them. You're bringing order. If you're a business owner or an entrepreneur, you are creating jobs for the community. You're helping the local economy. If you're in sales, then you're helping people see things that they need to improve their lives and their existence. And if you're here this morning and you're a stay-at-home mom, then you do everything I just listed and a lot, and a lot more. And the point here being that this is not just true of the work you get paid to do, but this is true of all the work in our lives. So what does this mean? It means a few things. Number one, it means that your work it matters. If you've ever thought, does my work matter? It matters. It has meaning. It makes, it makes a difference. And the way in which you do your work matters, because you do know that not everybody does work in a way that honors God, right? There are people who, in their work, they take advantage of people. Whether it's a, a company that hikes up prices to the point of making an unreasonable amount of profit at the expense of people. Whether it's, um, maybe it's somebody who builds homes but, but does the, the cheapest version of the home, the, 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 the most ineffective version of the home just so they can save a few. That's bad work. Or maybe an, an example that hits close to home for me is, a, is an overcooked steak. When a chef overcooks a steak, that's, that's a sin. I mean, that's, that's bad <laughs> That's bad work. You get past medium rare and you're, you're, you're starting to anger God. So um, <laughs> the, way in which we, the way in which we do our work matters. This also means that you can glorify God in your work. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul says, whatever that you eat, drink, whatever you do, you can bring glory to God. So that means like whatever your job is, I don't know what you guys do. I don't need to know. I know that you can glorify God at your work. I know that you can. And not just by telling people that you work with about Jesus, which is fine if you have the opportunity to do it, but by being the best worker in your company, by working with excellence, integrity, skill. That's what should set Christians apart, not the fact that we don't say certain words or go to certain parties. What should really set us apart is the work we do should be the best work that anybody's doing because we're imaging our God in our work. So some people simply endure work. And... Uh, the second mistake that we make is that we adore work. We, we worship our work. Now, that might seem weird that somebody would worship their work, but you know, historically, if you wanted to know who or what someone worshipped, you paid attention to the sacrifices they made. Don't people make lots of sacrifices for work? Lots and lots of sacrifices to be successful at work. Think about this. Some people, uh, as we said, some people work to live, but some people live to work, and they sacrifice things like their health. We actually have a saying in our, um, in our society that people work themselves to, to death. You know, Japanese language, they had, to create, they, had to, they had to create a word, it's kuroshi, and it literally means to die at your desk. Because it happened so frequently in that culture, they had to come up with a word just to bring clarity to what had happened. People sacrifice their health and their life for work. Some people sacrifice their happiness, their emotional well-being, their mental well-being, their relationship. Some people lay their family on the altar of their career or their marriage, um, the character, their integrity. We adore work, and so we make sacrifices. And by the way, it's not just work we adore, but sometimes it's the feelings that work gives us. You know what I'm talking about? The feeling of being successful, meaningful, that you matter, that you're in control, that you have power, that you're a winner, and that's where you look for it, at work. And that's what you need most. That's what your heart craves. Sometimes it's not just the feelings that work provides, but it's the finances that work provide. And so we worship the money that comes to us because it either provides us with significance or security, depending on whether we're a spender or a saver. But either way, we're worshiping that. Our heart adores and is set on that. And then for some of us, what we really worship when it comes to work is the future that we believe work secures for us. So we work, 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 as Jonathan said, like a dog, or not like a dog. And, uh, and in doing so, we think we've secured a future for ourselves. But look at, think about what you're looking for in those cases. You're looking for work to give you peace and meaning and purpose. 
You're looking, work, looking for work to provide something for you, and you're looking for work to secure your future for you. You know what you just, you know what you're, you, that basically describes everything that Jesus has done for us. And you're looking to your work, and you're adoring it, and you're worshiping it. Now, is this you? Let me give you some, some, some maybe indicators that you might struggle with this. Because work is a good thing. We've already established that, but it's not a God thing. There's a big difference. Here's some ways that work might, becoming a, might become a God thing for you. Uh, you don't know who you are apart from your work. Every conversation you have is about work. Every time you meet somebody, they need, you need them to know within the first couple minutes what you do for work because it's really what gives you your identity. You can't walk away from work. I don't mean like physically you can't walk away from the office, but I mean mentally. I mean, I've been there. You've been there, right? You're home. I'm home. I'm playing Battleship with my daughter, but I'm still solving problems back at work. It's something we, it's something we all struggle with, but is it something you're always struggling with? This could, be a, this could be a God to you. Another way that you'll know this is that you're jealous of people in your line of work who seem to be doing better than you, who seem to be more celebrated for doing the same work, and you're very gift, you're very, you have a real great spiritual gift at pointing out all their weaknesses. Or the people who aren't as good as you and aren't as far as long as you, you look down your nose at them and you comfort yourself thinking, well, at least I'm doing better than so-and-so. I mean, he's been doing this job for 20 years. Look at him. I've only been here eight years and I'm already... And then the other thing is that you know that you're struggling with this when you're a slave to work and what work provides for you. Here's, here's the summary of this whole thought. We've been created to worship through our work, but never to worship our work. We worship through our work. We don't just endure work. We worship through it, but we don't adore work. We don't worship our work because work ultimately can't give us what we most need, which is peace, joy, meaning, purpose, apart from our ability to perform. Because work is always about performing. Last point this morning is this. How can we get work right? In order to get work right, we have to see two things. The first thing we have to see is how much God values work. We've talked about this a lot, so I'll be quick here. But God values work so much that he chooses to first reveal himself to us as a worker. God values work so much that he doesn't even finish the garden until he has somebody to work it. I mean, that really is the thought process. What, what, I got this garden, no one's here to tend it, no one's here to keep it. I'm going to create an image bearer to work. That's how much God values work. And God also values work because in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3, we read that on the seventh day, God rested. Now, why does God rest? Because he's exhausted, because he's tired, because he stayed up late watching a football game? God doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired. God rests because he's satisfied with his work. He's really created this temple for, in which his presence can dwell and all our image bearers to go and extend his presence throughout creation. And so he delights in his work, and he rests to enjoy his work. God values work. And if we can see how much God values work, it will keep us from just simply enduring work. But how do we keep from adoring work? Well, we have to not just see how much God values work. You have to also see how much God values you, how much God values you. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin, and after the fall, in verse 20, or in verse 7, look, exa- look at what happens. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Now hold on. The gardeners are sewing fig leaves together to cover themselves. This is very significant. What's happening here? God had told them to tend and keep the garden, to leave it better than they found it, and then all of a sudden they're ripping leaves off of trees. Now, I'm not a gardener, but I'm pretty sure that's not how you tend and keep a garden. So what are they doing? Adam and Eve are using the very thing they were mandated to work with to try to cover themselves, to try to cover their sin, to try to cover their shame, to try to cover their physical nakedness, but also the bigger issue is they're trying to cover their spiritual nakedness. And listen, covering your spiritual nakedness, your shame, your sense of inadequacy, the the, the tormenting question of have I done enough, am I good enough, am I enough, that's the one work you and I can't do. We can't cover ourselves. We cannot do it for ourselves. And so many people, just like Adam and Eve, use their work to try to cover themselves. They adore their work They put their hope in their work. They put their trust in the work, but you can't do it. There's not enough work in the world to cover your sense of inadequacy. 
There's not enough career success to make you have peace. It just doesn't exist. There weren't enough fig leaves in the garden to cover their sense of nakedness. There's not enough work in this world to cover your sense of nakedness. So what do we do? What hope do we have? Well, look how much God values them. It says in verse uh, 11, 21 that the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and he clothed them. He covered them. But what had to happen in order for God to cover Adam and Eve, an animal had to die. Blood had to be shed so that their nakedness could be covered. And what we have here is this beautiful foreshadowing of the cross. That Jesus walked to the cross and allowed himself to be sacrificed, allowed his blood to be shed so that we could be covered. And it's his unchanging, unmerited, undeserved work that covers us, that gives us righteousness, that gives us peace, that gives us purpose. It's his work, not our work. And that's actually really good news because our work is terribly inconsistent. Our work is terribly inadequate. But Jesus' work is perfect. It never changes. It was done on your behalf. And when he shed his blood, it's this truth in the scriptures that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so because of Jesus' work, here's how it frees you up if you're a Christian. It frees you up in two ways when it comes to work. And I'll close with this. Number one, now you can work in, now when you do your work, you know that it matters. You can work in a way knowing that your work matters. You, you have the joy of doing work because you know your work matters, but you also have the freedom of knowing that your work doesn't define you. Your work makes a difference, but it doesn't make you. That's the unique approach that Christians have when it comes to work. We work in a way where we have the joy of knowing everything we do makes a difference because we're imaging God and we're working for the good of creation. But also, nothing we do actually defines us. What Jesus did, his work, defines us. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that your word is living and active and that this ancient text has so much still to say to our everyday lives. Help us to live, to work, to play, to interact with one another in a way that is worship to you, being who we were created to be, doing what we were created to do for your glory, for your honor, and for the good of creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and respond in song.